Sorry about that. I was muted. Uh, welcome to module number one. Sorry. Uh, basic networking and routing concepts. Now, it's not necessarily um, that these are really basic concepts. I mean, it's called basic, but uh, to me, it's more just, just kind of the foundation stuff that you need to know before we move into some of the more advanced modules. You know, obviously, we're going to differentiate between the different dynamic routing protocols. And I'll talk to you guys about, uh, you know, the distinct um, differences uh, between those uh, between the protocols, not not specifically like what's the difference between uh, EIGRP and OSPF, but really what's the difference between say distance vector and link state? What's the distant difference between a, an exterior protocol versus an interior protocol, and so on? When we get into the individual protocols, that's excuse me, that's when we'll spend a lot more time talking about the specifics of the protocols themselves. Um, We'll take a look at the different types of traffic in network, uh, different network types, uh, what's an overlay network and how can that influence our networking and our routing concepts. Uh, and then we'll take a look at, uh, you know, what are some of the branch connectivity options, things like what is a layer two uh, VPN, what is a layer three VPN, uh, and how does that information, how does that information affect us, uh, you know, from our decision standpoint as to what types of technologies that we're going to implement in a service provider managed network or a service provider managed VPN. We'll even take a look at enterprise managed VPNs in the, in the concept of DMVPN, dynamic multipoint VPN. We'll take a look at that. Uh, now, we don't get into it in a whole lot of detail, right? There's not even a lab exercise where we go through DMVPN, but we do introduce the concepts and we talk about those concepts uh, and, and what we call, the, well, really just differentiating between what a service provider managed VPN is versus an enterprise managed VPN and so on. And then we'll wrap up the, the module by talking about RIP Next Generation, uh, which allows us to do things like IPv6 routing. I mean, it is still, uh, somewhat uh, limited in what its capabilities are, particularly with its metric and so on. But we still talk about it because it allows us to introduce some of these other concepts that I think are really important as we talk about, you know, other uh, routing protocols later on, specifically related to IPv6. All right. So let's get into lesson number one. Uh, I believe that we have in this particular module uh, we're going to talk about four different lessons. So we'll break down this module into four different lessons. But in lesson number one, we're just going to talk about what are the differences between our routing protocols, right? Obviously, we have, well, essentially five unique protocols that we can choose from in an enterprise. We've got uh, our IGP routing protocols, which include RIP, BG, uh, excuse me, RIP EIGRP, OSPF, ISIS. Uh, we don't really talk about ISIS in this class, but that is a, an interior protocol that does exist and is available to us. Uh, so those are our four IGP routing protocols. And then uh, what rounds out the top five is BGP, the Border Gateway Protocol. Even though it's, uh, it's still part of the, the group of five or the gang of five that we talk about typically, uh, it's a completely different routing protocol than, say, OSPF, EIGRP, uh, RIP, and ISIS. Uh, so we need to be able to identify, you know, when is it, how do I choose a routing protocol in my enterprise? What is, uh, how do I base, you know, what do I, what are the criteria that I base that decision on? Uh, and so on, you know, what's the role of a dynamic routing protocol within my enterprise network? Uh, what are the major differences between the different protocols? You know, what's the difference between distance vector and link state? Uh, we'll, we'll go through a, a discussion about that. Um, you know, and then just what are the major differences between, say, an IGP routing protocol and an EGP routing protocol, uh, and so on. Um, we'll talk about convergence and why that's a particular concern when we're dealing with a type of routing protocols that we have to deal with. Convergence basically simply relates to how quickly the protocols can can uh, can deal with change in the enterprise. Um, and uh, then we'll talk about route summarization. That's a really, really important concept. Um, 
and uh, that is something that that we definitely will spend a, a lot of time talking about, especially when it comes to uh, implementing protocols efficiently. Uh, route summarization, not just the technique of route summarization is important, but understanding the impact on topology databases and link state databases uh, that implementing route summarization has on our on our network uh, and and in our enterprise to get all together. Uh, and then we'll talk about scalability, right? Uh, speed of convergence and scalability are really two of the primary factors in deciding what type of IGP routing protocol that we're going to use in our enterprise. So it's very important from a practical standpoint to understand the uh, the importance of convergence. What are the design elements that I can incorporate into a routing protocol that makes it converge more quickly? And then also, uh, what are the design elements that I can implement that allows me to scale the protocol to a much larger environment? So that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, actually, really throughout the entire class, honestly, every one of these protocols that we talk about, we kind of talk about those, those concepts. All right. Uh, now, Cisco uses a modular architecture to define functionality in the enterprise. This isn't one of my favorite diagrams that Cisco has in their courseware, but nonetheless, it's still uh, functionally, it's still uh, a valuable uh, representation of what we call the building blocks of, of building an enterprise network. Uh, the idea here is that, uh, and you may or may not within your organization have your, each one of these individual blocks, but the idea here is that we're, we're, we're identifying functionality within our enterprise based on these, uh, these concepts, right? In the building access layer, for example, we're going to have uh, specific functions that are going to be necessary. Typically, that's where switching tends to take a role. Things like 802.1x and power over Ethernet and VLANs get extended to this layer, uh, port security, uh, and so on. Uh, and then we start to see in our building distribution layer where we're starting to run our IGP routing uh, protocols and, and um, uh, you know, getting involved in in um, routing concepts and we'll talk about that and then the campus backbone of course that's all routing right in fact this is the three layer traditional three layer model that you see this campus backbone followed by the building distribution followed by the building access that's our core distribution and access layer traditional three layer hierarchical model uh, building distribution is where all all of our policies get implemented uh, that's where QoS policies are implemented. That's where VLANs get routed. Uh, that's where uh, maybe policy-based routing gets implemented. First hop redundancy protocols can be implemented here as well, uh, and so on. The campus backbone, primarily the goal of the campus backbone is just to make sure that we have the ability to route. And that's the goal of the backbone is to route as quickly as possible. All right. Uh, then the edge distribution. Edge distribution is typically where we're going to have maybe connectivity uh, to our internet edge or WAN edge. If we have an e-commerce function, we might have an e-commerce block. Remote access and VPN function, we might have connectivity to that as well and so on. There's a difference between internet edge and WAN edge. Uh, WAN is typically uh, still service provider based infrastructure, but it is a private type of VPN architecture, whereas internet is exactly what it sounds like, just traditional internet connectivity. Uh, these can be blended together. For example, if you're doing a layer three MPLS VPN, you can participate in an internet-based VPN for internet traffic, and then you can participate in, in um, corporate uh, service provider managed VPN for, for site-to-site -site connectivity. Uh, so there, you know, these aren't, this isn't the, the end-all be-all to network design, these blocks don't always guarantee. Uh, you know, you're not going to necessarily have all these blocks in your enterprise, but uh, or you might have some that, that kind of get merged together and so on. Uh, but uh, in any event, that's uh, this is the enterprise architecture. In the book, they talk about enterprise campus versus enterprise edge. 
you can imagine what the distinction is there, right? Enterprise campus is really the core of the distribution and the access layer. Res Enterprise Edge provides that functionality. Each of these kind of light blue boxes generally mean that there's some sort of third party involved, um, third party communication, whatever it might be, uh, service provider infrastructure and so on, all right? Now the role of a dynamic protocol obviously is to disseminate routing information and that's the overall goal of a, a routing protocol. And these are some ideas of where these protocols might reside, where they might exist. I, I don't agree with the fact that RIP, RIP probably shouldn't be there at all, right? Um, not to suggest that it's, uh, well, yeah, I guess to suggest that it's really not a great routing protocol. Um, I mean, because it really isn't. Uh, it might be suitable for stub routing where you might only have one path to a to a destination or maybe one one path to to meet, to reach multiple destinations but it's not really a very suitable routing protocol when you have multiple paths with different speeds and whatnot and that's because of the limitations of rip and we'll talk about what those limitations are when we get into the rip section a little bit later on uh, clearly within our campus design we're going to be implementing things like OSPF or EIGRP because those are our IGP routing protocols, typical IGP routing protocols. Uh, and then uh, with regard to the um, internet or even, uh, even the WAN itself, you might be running something like BGP or if you, if you have multiple ISP connections or multiple connections to the internet, you might be running BGP, but uh, or you might just simply be running static routing. Okay, so um, these are these are definitely things to consider. And obviously, as we go into each one of these protocols and we start to get into the the weeds, if you will, um, it's this this course is is a lot of courses that you go through. It's kind of like a mile wide and an inch deep. Uh, this course is also is not only just a mile wide, but it's also a mile deep. Uh, yeah, let's get rid of that. Sorry about that. Um, so we'll talk about that and we'll get into that, that part of it as we kind of go through the process here. Okay. Uh, and you guys feel free to interrupt me at any time. If you have questions, you have comments, uh, you know, this is supposed to be a, uh, a community. Uh, it's a very small class, obviously. So you guys feel free to, to interject at any time if you have any questions or comments or whatever. I mean, that's what we're here for, right? To, to learn as much as we can about all this. So how do I choose the optimal routing protocol for my environment, right? Now, uh, they mention, uh, you know, kind of three different things here. Um, and, and I think that these are valid points. These uh, first three bullet points, the size of the network, uh, whether or not that particular protocol is multi-vendor supported and so on. And the knowledge level of the protocol is important, but um, you know there there are other aspects to considering a routing protocol. In fact, I would say more importantly would be the protocol characteristics. Right? Does the protocol fit the size of the enterprise that I'm working with? Now, most modern routing protocols scale well beyond even the largest enterprise network capabilities. Right? Uh, for example, EIGRP, uh, 100 routers in diameter, all right? Well, you can pretty much get anywhere in the world in less than 50 hops, uh, even less than that. So from a scalability standpoint, EIGRP is somewhat limitless from the perspective of diameter of the network. It's not limitless from the perspective of the density of the network. Uh, EIGRP lacks a, uh, a hierarchical function, right? What do I mean by that? It lacks a hierarchical function. Any ideas? Any thoughts? And let's say, let me, let me add to that. Let me say as compared to say OSPF. Uh, well, EIGRP does have a topology database, um, but the hierarchy that I'm referencing is the concept of multi-area design versus a flat architecture. EIGRP routers are implemented within a single autonomous system, which becomes one big flat domain, essentially. Not flat in the sense of single broadcast domain, but flat in the sense of there's no hierarchy 
to the uh, design itself. Whereas OSPF includes things like the backbone area and non-backbone areas, and then you can incorporate the use of special area types and so on. So from a scalability perspective, that might seem like a limitation of EIGRP, but EIGRP has benefits that say OSPF doesn't have. Actually, EIGRP can be designed to, to, to uh, uh, converge faster than OSPF. EIGRP inherently in its design, uh, even though it is a distance vector routing protocol fundamentally, uh, requires less resources, fewer resources than say OSPF. The databases are not nearly as complex. We don't have to, to concern ourselves so much with different network types like broadcast and non-broadcast and and point to point and point to multi-point and point to multi-point non-broadcast and so on. So there's definitely pros and cons uh, to each of these protocols and I don't want to get off the rails here and go way into what those are. We'll talk about those concepts when we get into the routing protocols. Um, and and uh, that's, that's, that's really the distinct difference here, right? With the exception of my CCNA class, I, I like to teach it from an engineering perspective, but I always tell students, you know, there's a difference between being a network administrator and being a network engineer. Uh, a network administrator knows how to turn on OSPF, knows how to maybe configure summarization and so on. A network engineer understands the impact of implementing protocols in a specific way, implementing specific features of a protocol and so on. Uh, and I teach this very much from the perspective uh, of the, the, the engineering concept. All right. So uh, that's one aspect. Speed of convergence is very important as well. Speed of convergence is, uh, has strictly to do with how quickly the protocol relays its information uh, to other routing protocols in the same domain, number one. Uh, and number two, how quickly those protocols uh, react to changes in the topology, right? Uh, for example, uh, you know, a network might go down, a network might come up. You know, how long does it take for that router to recognize that change and how long does it take for that router to propagate that change. Traditionally, distance vector routing protocols didn't really do so well in the convergence space, right? Uh, there were a whole bunch of deterministic timers that were set uh, for loop avoidance primarily, uh, loop avoidance mechanisms. Um, but, uh, and you really couldn't design that out of the protocol. Now, understand, even though EIGRP is classified as distance vector, there still is a fundamental difference. EIGRP doesn't necessarily need to go into that category. I joke about this when my students and I say, hey, uh, you guys watch those uh, talent shows on, on TV, right? Uh, like American Idol or whatever. And then they, they have their little group rounds where they talk about, uh, um, you know, they, they, they compete as a group or, or they do group voting or whatever. And you, you just know if I'm in that group with that guy, then there's no way I'm making it to the next round, right? Well, EIGRP, unfortunately, kind of gets classified with RIP and IGRP and, and these other quote-unquote distance vector routing protocols. But, uh, and, and generally speaking, distance vector protocols are considered to be less kind of uh, useful in a routing domain, but EIGRP is kind of a unique monster in that case. That's why it's often classified as a hybrid routing protocol uh, even though fundamentally it is still distance vector. And I'm going to go through a discussion in a minute to describe to you guys the difference between distance vector and link state, even though it's not necessarily covered in detail in this, uh, uh, in this class. I think it's a really important concept to get, even though you're not going to be tested on it. Uh, but, uh, you know, fundamentally it's just one of those things that you just need to know. All right. All right, so um, that's what we'll talk about, right? Uh, when it comes to a routing protocol, there are essentially three things. Let me open up my notepad and type these in here because I think this is really important to understand. 
there are three things for with any routing protocol that you have to understand. All right, let me get this uh, scaled in here so that uh, it gets into the recording. All right. Uh, obviously, we're going to talk about the difference between distance vector uh, versus uh, link state. Okay, we'll talk about that. But here's the th three things that really make up a routing protocol. All right, you've got the routing protocol messages. All right, uh, and I'll, I'll break that down in a minute. You've got the um, uh, routing protocol data structures. Uh, and then finally, you have the routing protocol algorithm. All right. So when it, when, when it comes to breaking down any routing protocol, uh, whether it's BGP or ISIS or EIGRP or OSPF, the most important thing to understand fundamentally from an engineering standpoint are what, how do these three things work within that protocol? And if you can think of any routing protocol that you deal with from this perspective, you'll basically be able to learn everything there is to know about that particular protocol, uh, especially from a theory perspective, right? Obviously, there's going to be different configurations and implementations. But uh, from a theory perspective, this is what it's all about. All right. So when I talk about routing protocol messages, you know, in EIGRP, we're talking about a hello packet, right? An update packet, a query packet, a uh, uh, acknowledgement, a reply, and so on. When it comes to OSPF, we've got the hello packet. We've got uh, the uh, link state acknowledgement. We've got a link state update. We've got a link state request. Uh, and we have something called a DBD. Yeah, so, and then of course BGP has open and, and connect and a bunch of different messages as well and notification messages and so on. Uh, we'll talk about all the different routing protocol messages and what the purposes of those routing protocol messages are, um, you know, and, uh, and, and really just get into that as we get into each of the protocols. But you guys can certainly understand what the need is for a routing protocol message. It's the way that, it's the language that the protocols speak. It's the way that they disseminate information, whether it's something new, something that's changed, request for information, whatever it might be, all right? Now, we will get into, I don't know if I spelled query right, that looks a little weird, but uh, we will get into um, these concepts, right? Uh, why do I send a query? Why do I send an acknowledgement? You know, what, what situation is necessary for a query to be generated? Uh, what, what is a DBD? Uh, what is a link state request and so on? All right. Then we have routing protocol data structures. And here it's really quite simple. You've got uh, a neighbor table, right? We'll call it a database, all right? Sometimes this is called an adjacency database. Uh, and that, that exists in BGP, OSPF, EIGRP, not so much in RIP, but uh, you got a list of the neighbors. These are my information sources. You've got some sort of topology database. Uh, one thing that you guys will learn about me as we go through the class is that I definitely don't type very well, um, but uh, usually gets better throughout the day. Uh, topology database is everything I learn, all right? Everything I'm learning. Uh, not just what I'm using, but everything I'm learning. And that topology database in, in, in RIP exists. The topology database in EIGRP exists. It's actually called the topology database. In OSPF, it's called the link state database. In BGP, it's called the BGP uh, table or BGP database. Uh, but that's everything that I learn. And then finally, you've got your routing database, uh, which is basically what am I using, all right? Which essentially is your routing table, all right? It's your routing table. So um, obviously, as you look at the, the, the steps here, one has to come before the other, right? For example, 
there's no way for me to build a topology database unless I have neighbors, right? So from a troubleshooting perspective, hint, hint for the troubleshooting exam, from a troubleshooting perspective, uh, the first thing you're going to look at, the first concept is going to be, do I have neighbors? Because if I don't have neighbors, there's nothing that I can learn. I don't have a way of learning anything. Uh, and then, of course, am I learning everything that I expect to learn? Not only about the best route, the next best route, the third best route, the fourth best route, and so on. All right. And then finally, a routing database, uh, which is what I'm actually using uh, in, you know, the routing table is not specific to an individual protocol. We only have one routing table per protocol stack, one for IPv4, one for IPv6, and that will include static routes, connected routes, local routes, EIGRP, OSPF, and so on. But the routing database is what I'm actually using. All right. It's what I'm actually using. All right. So, and then finally, we, we wrap up with the routing protocol algorithms, and each protocol kind of has its own algorithm. Uh, RIP uses the Bellman Ford algorithm, um, and uh, EIGRP uses like Dijkstra, I mean, uh, Dijkstra's, uh, the dual diffuse, diffuse update algorithm. And uh, OSPF uses Dijkstra's algorithm, D-I-J-K-S-T-R-A-S, uh, which is called the shortest path first algorithm, which, by the way, ISIS uses as well. Uh, let me put a dash in there. All right. And then BGP. Um, BGP is a little bit uh, kind of unique, right? And we'll see this when we get into module number five, six, module number six. Uh, we'll talk about BGP. BGP um, fundamentally is a distance vector protocol. Uh, from the perspective of um, routing between autonomous systems, inside the autonomous system, it's not necessarily distance vector, but getting from one autonomous system to another, it's fundamentally distance vector. But that's not really the algorithm. Uh, it is a path vector protocol. All right, so. The algorithm is, is making choices based on these things, these things called path vector attributes. Uh, and there's, you know, 15, 14, 15 different choices BGP uh, uses to make, make routing decisions. Uh, it's a very unique routing protocol, and you guys will see this a little bit later on. Uh, it doesn't use metrics uh, in a traditional sense. Uh, it does have a value called metric, but it's not a metric, uh, and so on. So these are some of the concepts uh, that we will talk about. Uh, and, and this is this is kind of how it's going to work, guys. I mean, obviously, there's a, a none of that's covered in this slide here, but it's really important to understand from the perspective of deciding what type of protocol I'm going to use, uh, and so on. All right. So some of the input requirements is the size of the network. I would say that that's, for the most part, unless you actually really do want to use RIP, for the most part, size of the network doesn't really play as much of a role uh, unless you've got 50,000, 100,000 different nodes and, and you've got hundreds and hundreds of subnets and, and hundreds or maybe potentially thousands of routers. Uh, all of these protocols can scale to a very large environment with the exception of one, which is RIP. Uh, and, and so from a scalability standpoint, uh, it's not necessarily as big of a concern. Now, that being said, size did not always mean the diameter of the network. When I say diameter, I mean to get from point A to point Z, how many hops do I have to go through? Size can also mean density of the network. Uh, and that's a very, very important concept to understand. Density versus depth, right? Density means how many alternate paths do I have through my network? How many potential neighbors do I have uh, to interconnect those different paths? Um, all very important concepts when it, when it comes to size. 
you know, and and every protocol has a different way of handling that. Um, uh, certainly with OSPF, we have the ability to integrate a hierarchy. We can do a backbone area. We do our non-backbone areas. We can introduce the concept of special area types uh, and so on. In the IGRP, it's a flat architecture, but we can still implement things like um, summarization and, and other things that will make the network a lot more efficient. All right. Multi-vendor support. Eh, maybe. Maybe that's a concern. I mean, I've seen that from time to time from customers. They, they decide not to choose EIGRP because they may want to put in a Juniper router for some reason or another. Or they may want to put in some sort of uh, extreme router or some other type of equipment. Now, um, all of my other protocols, BGP and, and OSPF and ISIS, those are all open standard protocols and can be run essentially on any platform. But uh, EIGRP traditionally has been Cisco only up until July of 2013 when Cisco uh, released it as an open, well, they, they wrote an RFC that they kind of made it an open standard, at least the fundamental functions of EIGRP. That still doesn't mean that vendors have to run it. Right, Juniper is probably not going to jump on board and jump on the EIGRP train anytime soon. Uh, but, uh, you know, I have seen people decide to use OSPF simply for the fact that EIGRP is Cisco only. All right. Hey, Scott, uh, real quick. On, yes, sir. That topic. Right. So, um, you know, we ran EIGRP for you know, 15 years at, at Radiant. And then a couple of years ago, we went to Palo Alto Firewalls. It does. Okay. Yeah, it does. It's not that it's not that you, the, the protocols can't coexist. Uh, it just makes it more complicated, right? Because now you have to redistribute those routes between the protocols, and then and then that requires knowledge of redistribution, and and you have to plant seed metrics and and do all these things. It just it just makes it just more complicated overall to to do that, right? Um, so. Uh, and OSBF fundamentally as a protocol is a very, very robust routing protocol. The challenge you run into though, right, is how do you migrate from EIGRP to OSPF? You now have to learn a new protocol. You have to understand the impact of that protocol. And, and, and it, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses to all of these different protocols. Uh, the list of minuses for RIP far exceeds the list of pluses for RIP. But uh, from a perspective of EIGRP and OSPF, uh, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses for both. And, and you could make an argument um, for saying, well, let's go ahead and stick with the IGRP and just do redistribution at the edge because of X, Y, and Z. Um, but then you could also make the argument of going the other way. Let's not, let's use a ubiquitous protocol throughout the enterprise and, uh, and stick with OSPF. So you guys will see what those pluses and minuses are as we talk about the protocols. Um, and you'll get a pretty good understanding of, of, you know, why you would choose one versus the other. I always tell people in these classes, if you want to become uh, a commodity in this industry, uh, a routing expert, two protocols you need to know are OSPF and BGP. Uh, and that's because they're the two most widely used routing protocols. Um, now, service provider industry, not so much. ISIS tends to be more of a protocol that's used and uh, EIGRP is not a bad routing protocol. Uh, but in all honesty, once you learn the engineering principles of one routing protocol, you can very easily adapt those principles to other routing protocols as you learn them. Uh, you'll, you'll find that there's a lot of similarities between these protocols. Uh, there are definitely a lot of differences, but, you know, there are definitely a lot of similarities as well. All right. All right. Uh, I, I do like that third bullet point, though. Uh, I'm going to use EIGRP because I know how to use it. Uh, uh, well, it's probably not necessarily, a, shouldn't be at the top of the list as far as why you would choose to use a protocol. 
Um, but uh, but it definitely plays into the into the role. I mean, I, I can't tell you guys how many times I've gone into a customer's network and and looked at an OSPF implementation and just shuddered, uh, and and the, the hairs on my arms stood up because it's just so poorly implemented. Um, it, it's very easy to implement these protocols. Uh, I could teach you guys how to implement OSPF and EIGRP in in a half a day. Uh, but implementation is just one aspect of it. Design elements are extremely important. Sorry? Like you said, understanding the impact, right? Yeah, the impact of the design, right? Um, the impact of implementing summarization or not implementing summarization. You know, the impact of implementing special area types or special router types and so on. So, uh, so as we... Understanding, uh, you know, when you make that change, what's going to happen with EIGRP over here and, and right. LS routes over there and all that jazz. That's, that's exactly that's right. Important. Yep. Uh, and and again, that's to me, that's really the the key difference between an engineer and a and a an administrator. Uh, administrators, you know, have these ideas about, you know, oh, I put this network statement in, and I and I and I make this interface passive, and I do this, and I do that. But you don't really understand the, the, the language. You don't understand the, the, the algorithms and everything else. So we're going to get into all that as, uh, as part of our process, obviously. Okay? All right. Uh, let's see here. IGP versus EGP. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this particular slide. Uh, it's a pretty simple concept. An IGP is an interior protocol that you're going to run inside your enterprise. Uh, usually it's a domain that you have complete control over. Uh, whereas an EGP protocol, and there's only one that exists, there used to be two. In fact, the very, very first routing protocol was EGP. It was actually a routing protocol. Uh, let me see if I can pull up uh, the timeline real quick. Uh, it was the very first routing protocol um, but, uh, let me pull this up, but it wasn't the very first IGP routing protocol. Uh, the very first IGP routing protocol was, uh, IGRP, which was an invented in, um, 1985. Uh, let me show you guys this, uh, this little image here. Pull this over. Doo -doo -doo. So uh, it's kind of a blurry image, but you can kind of see EGP uh, came out in 1990, 1982, excuse me, the Exterior Gateway Protocol, uh, when basically everything was exterior, right? You were doing switching and bridging inside your enterprise, and you did some basic routing between different enterprises. Uh, and then IGRP was invented in 1985. Uh, you'll notice that it, it's kind of classified in this list here with RIP and EGP, um, bad, bad protocols, right? Because they were classful. Uh, let's talk about that real quick. What, we don't really care about this too much today because all of our modern routing protocols are classless. But what is the fundamental difference between classful and classless? Any ideas? Um, yeah, it's, um, I know this because back in the day, you used to have to type classless if you're doing any kind of irregular subnetting. Right. Right, and that's really the fundamental difference, right? Uh, a class full routing protocol, which sounds good, you know, the name sounds good, but it's actually a very bad concept. It means that the protocol does not support summarization. It, it works on major class full boundaries. Uh, you can't do variable link subnet masks. You can't do summarization. You can't do anything that would change the, the, the way the mask operates in the network. Uh, so we didn't get into classless routing until 1990. Uh, now, it, that's an interesting concept because there, there's two different RFCs um, that, that have to do with this. Uh, and... Um, 
most people they 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 think of RFC 1918 as really the the first time that we saw um, this idea of uh, subnetting and all that, but it was actually RFC 1518, which is the actual CIDR RFC, which came out in 1993, right? Uh, RFC 1518 came out in 1993, and that's what defined this concept of classless interdomain routing. Uh, and that's where you saw, let me pull that timeline up again. Routing protocol timeline. Uh, and that's where you saw uh, the advent of these, these different protocols. Let me see if I have maybe a better diagram here. Uh, let's see. This one looks like it might be higher quality. So as I said, you know, RFC 1518, which basically defined classless routing. Well, you see that's kind of around the time frame that all of the modern protocols started to become popular, right? Now, RIP version 1 was class, classful, IGRP was classful, EGP was classful. So these protocols have since been deprecated not really considered to be modern. Classless means we support subnetting, we support variable link subnet masks, summarization. Uh, and there's some other enhancements to these protocols as well. RIP version two came out in 1994. EIGRP came out in 1992, uh, as a pre even, even before the CIDR uh, RFC came out. So, uh, you know, Cisco was driving this, this initiative uh, OSPF was classless as well, but um, but again, RFC 1518 did not actually get published until September of 1993. So uh, the timeline doesn't quite sync up, but that's really where modern routing came of, came of age in the early 90s, and, and it's still the stuff same stuff that we use today. Obviously, IPv6, the protocols have been classless the entire time because there was never a class distinction for IPv6. It's always been classless, all right? Uh, this chart actually does kind of summarize everything. It talks about the difference between distance vectors. So this is your kind of your distance vector category here. Uh, RIP, IGRP, EIGRP. That's why I said EIGRP kind of gets a bad rap because it's it, it gets thrown into the category of all these other really bad routing protocols. So it kind of gets a bad rap, but it's uh, it's an enhanced it's an enhanced distance vector routing protocol. Fundamentally, still distance vector in its operation and uh, how it disseminates information, but uh, but does have a lot of enhancements that makes it very efficient. Link state, OSPF, and ISIS. ISIS stands for intermediate system to intermediate system. You know, this is an interesting routing protocol as well. We won't get into it too much. Um, but uh, ISIS is actually operates at layer two, believe it or not. Uh, it uses the data link layer to exchange routing information. Uh, it's a very, very unique concept. Uh, and actually, let me extend on that a little bit because I'm uh, a member of several different... Uh, Facebook groups and, uh, you know, IT Facebook groups and CCNA, CCMP and so on. Um, but uh, one of the most interesting arguments that I've seen recently on those groups is what layer do routing protocols operate at? Um, and uh, the answer to that question is, well, it depends. Yes, obviously, ideally, the goal of a routing protocol is to disseminate routing information. And everybody knows Networking 101 routing occurs at layer three of the OSI model. But ISIS is layer two. EIGRP and OSPF are layer three routing protocols because they actually sit right on top of the network layer, protocol 88 and protocol 89 respectively. But then you got RIP, which is an application layer routing protocol. It actually sits at layer seven because it rides on top of UDP. So RIP is actually an application layer protocol. 
Uh, BGP is also an application layer protocol because it sits on top of TCP. Uh, so it's an interesting concept, right? It's still, these are protocols that are used to disseminate routing information and to build our routing architecture, and routing is layer three strictly, but not all these protocols operate at layer three. So uh, that's another interesting concept. It's not something you need to know for the exam, but you know, it's just one of those little pieces of information that I find very interesting about these particular protocols uh, is they, they, they kind of have different ways of, of operating and functioning. All right? Okay, so, so real quick, you know, so thinking about the protocol itself as supporting the routing scheme at the application layer, to me it, it just confuses things a little bit by saying that the actual routing is happening at layer 2. Right. It's almost like, you know, so that, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to put that together. Well, I know what you're saying, uh, and let me let me kind of give you a, a quick answer to that, right? Whenever it comes to routing, we say it's the it's the whole uh, the whole concept, and this goes way back to CCNA years and years ago, of Ting versus TED, right? Ting versus TED, T I N G versus T E D, right? Routing versus routed, uh, and IP is a routed protocol. Uh, IPv6 is a routed protocol. So when clients are communicating uh, at layer three, or, or in, when they're sending packets back and forth to each other, that is a function that occurs at layer three. Remember, the goal of a routing protocol, all right, is to disseminate information about network layer reachability, what we call NLRI, network layer reachability information. So uh, to one is the is is the concept of disseminating information about the networks. The other is actually routing between the networks. So dissemination of the information doesn't always happen at layer three, but the actual passing of data always happens at layer three. Does that make sense? So th that's the whole discussion of uh, Ting versus TED. Right, routing versus routed, um, and um, you know it's. You know, I found it extremely um, kind of eye-opening when I saw somebody post a question on one of these groups about, you know, what what layer does a routing protocol operate at, um, and it, it was amazing to me. Uh, it was one of the most talked about threads that I saw in that group, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people responding. Uh, but it was amazing to me what the varying thought processes were about that concept. And uh, oftentimes I'll get into these groups and I'll actually, uh, I try to participate as much as I can, um, but I'll actually build a lab in GNS3 and I'll open up Wireshark and do captures and demonstrate concepts. Uh, and I literally had to capture RIP datagrams and BGP datagrams to convince people that these protocols are application layer protocols. Um, because, uh, you know, a common misconception is, well, it's layer three, it's a routing protocol, it must be layer three. Um, the act of routing is layer three, the act of disseminating information may or may not be layer three. That's why ISIS operates at layer two, because we're just disseminating information. Uh, we're not, uh, we're not actually doing the routing, right? Uh, we're not routing the packets, I guess, if you will, okay? So uh, let's see, what do we got left here? All right. Um, we could just keep going, but uh, it's probably good to take a quick break. Let's do a 15-minute uh, break. Welcome back. So another concept that I want to talk to you guys about um, which again is not really, not really a, a, a really critical concept when it comes to understanding uh, what you need to understand for the exam. Uh, but as far as understanding the distinction between a distance vector and a link state routing protocol, this is a, a really important concept. You can see here that we have essentially three different classifications of protocols. We've got uh, distance vector routing protocols, which they uh, have put EIGRP and RIP version 2 under this category. IGRP falls under this category, so does RIP version 1, but 
Those, uh, again, are class full routing protocols, so they're somewhat deprecated. But uh, EIGRP and RIP version 2 fall under this category. Uh, we'll talk about what they mean by exchanges routes as vectors of distance and direction. I have a visual way of representing that that I think is a, is a really good way of identifying how these protocols function. Uh, and then we have exchanges uh, link state routing protocols, which OSPF and ISIS fall under. Uh, and then finally, path vector protocols. All right. Now you'll notice that uh, path vector is path and direction, distance and direction. So again, uh, BGP as a path vector routing protocol is very similar to a distance vector routing protocol. But what does all of this mean? Well, let me talk about this from the perspective of, why does it keep doing that? All right. Talk about this from the perspective of a, um, you know, visually, uh, is what I'm trying to say here. Get rid of that. I don't know why that's popping up there. But uh, let me give you guys an idea of, of how this looks visually. Uh, and I think this will give you a better understanding of what we mean by the difference between, say, a, a distance vector versus a link state protocol. So let's say, for example, I have uh, a network here. I'll draw this uh, really quickly. Uh, and let's go ahead and put some links between these routers. So I've got a link here, I've got a link here, uh, a link here, uh, a link over to here, a link down here. Um, actually, let's put in another router here. All right. And uh, let's go ahead and put that path in there. And maybe have a couple of redundant paths. And then all of this is going to be from the perspective of network X. And this is R1. All right. So we're going to take a look at, you know, how information is advertised uh, and, and what the difference is fundamentally between, say, distance vector and link state. In fact, let me just go ahead and add another connection right there. All right. So we know that uh, obviously fundamentally the goal of any routing protocol is to disseminate routing information. All right, reachability, what I called NLRI, network layer reachability information between uh, different routers. Uh, and from this perspective, we're talking strictly about network X and we're talking about strictly how router one decides to get to network X. Uh, let's say this guy here is router two and this guy here is router three, uh, and router four, and router five, and router six. All right? Now, um, router six, eh, I didn't do that right, but let's go ahead and make this guy router four. All right? So router four is attached to network X, uh, and it's obviously going to advertise that network to its neighbors, uh, whether it's RIP or EIGRP or OSPF or whatever. It's going to advertise those routes to its neighbors. All right. And then what's going to be attached to that route is a metric for that particular path. All right. So far, so good. That's basically what we uh, identify a routing protocol as doing is advertising routes and then uh, and then basically advertising some sort of metric information for that particular route. That sounds great, except for now, router six is going to advertise that route to router two. And it's going to advertise that route to router five, or router three, excuse me. And router five is also going to advertise that route to router two. So router two now needs to make a decision. Do I go over to router six to get to network X? Or do I go over to router five to get to network X? Now remember, this is a distance vector <coughs> process. Keep going here. Uh, teaching from my kitchen, so my dog does like to bark sometimes. All right, so again, router two needs to make a decision. Do I go over to router six? Do I go over to router five? Now, you guys probably are already aware of how router, router two is going to make that decision. It's going to say, well, the metric to get to network X through router six is this. The metric to get into network X through router five is this. So I'm going to choose the path with the lowest metric. And that makes 
basic sense. Routing protocols choose the best path based on the metric. However, this is where the distinction between distance vector and link state comes into play. Because router 2 advertises network X to router 1, but not all of the choices, the choice that router 2 made to get to that network. All right? Uh, go away. What's going on here? So what I mean is that Router 2 has made a choice. Let's say Router 2 decided it's going to go to Router 5 to get to Network X. So Router 2 made the choice to go over to Router 5 because Router 5 had a better metric. Well, all that Router 1 learns is that choice. It doesn't know that it, there's another option through Router 6. Okay. Same thing with Router 3. Router 3 could choose to go up here and over this way. It could choose to come up here and come down this way. It could choose to go this way. And Router 3 is going to make a decision based on the information that it gets from its neighbors. So when Router 3, let's say Router 3 decides that this is the best path, when Router 3 advertises the route over to Router 1, it's not a very good arrow, when Router 3 decides to advertise its route over to Router 1, it's only going to advertise the path that it chose. It's not going to advertise all of the choices. All right? This is called routing by rumor. Because ultimately what ends up happening is that everything beyond router 3 and router 2, from router 1's perspective, doesn't exist. All right? So router 1 doesn't know all of the different paths to get to network X. Router 1 uh, through Router 2, and Router 1 doesn't know all the different paths to get to Network X through Router 3. Router 1 is simply basing its decision on this route that was advertised by Router 2 and this route that was advertised by Router 3. All right? Now, if I take the same topology and I apply OSPF as a link state routing protocol, the way that that works is R4 advertises to its neighbor not only network X, but the state of every single link connected to router 4, which is why it's called a link state routing protocol. So it's going to advertise this link, it's going to advertise this link, it's going to advertise this link to router 5. That's going to go into Router 5's link state database. Router 5 is then going to take that information that it received from Router 4, plus the state of all the links that Router 5 is attached to, and it's going to advertise that to Router 2. Router 6 will do the same thing, et cetera, et cetera. So every one of these routers is advertising the state of all of the links attached to that router, not just Network X but every link attached to that router. So by the time I get to router one, router one has in its link state database a list of every network, every link, the state of every link in the topology, who, is it, who the link is connected to, what the cost of that link is, the metric in this case, everything. So R1 has a complete picture of the entire topology and instead of R1 making its routing decision based on the decision that Router 2 made and based on the decision that Router 3 made, and they made their decisions based on their neighbor's decisions, R1 puts itself at the center of the network and it starts calculating all of the paths because it has a complete picture and it says, okay, this path is going to cost me this, this path is going to cost me this, this path is going to cost me this, and it runs through every iteration that exists and it makes a routing decision based on that information. All right? Now, ultimately, routing is always about what? When it, when it comes to routing protocols, what is the ultimate goal about every router? Get to the next hop. Get to the next hop. That's exactly right. All right? So it's always about getting to the next hop, whether it's distance vector whether it's BGP, whether it's link state, it's always about getting to the packet to the next hop. 
That decision, though, how I decide what the next top is going to be is based on the amount of information that I have in my database and the algorithm that I use to make that decision. So distance vector protocols make decisions solely based on the, the decision that their neighbor made, which those neighbors made their decisions based on their neighbors. And, by, and you know, it's a domino effect. Everybody's making decisions based on what their neighbors made. It, R1 just doesn't have a complete picture of the topology. So fundamentally, distance vector protocols tend to be less knowledgeable of the network, not necessarily making poor decisions. I mean, EIGRP will probably make the same ultimate decision that OSPF would with regard to the next hop because they use very, I wouldn't say similar metrics, but a, a key component to both metrics is, is bandwidth. So, uh, you know, EIGRP and OSPF probably will end up picking the same next hop uh, in, in a lot of different cases. But the way that they chose that next hop is completely different. So what are the pros and cons then? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, real quick, if you don't mind. No, go ahead. So, yeah, so, so uh, link state is going to consider all paths. And so even if the path from R1 to R2 is longer than the path from R1 to R3, if getting from R2 to R5 and R4 is, is quicker than getting from R3 to R6 to R4, then it's going it's to choose R2. Correct. Right? Okay. Yes, it, it but... Right, which is why it's called a shortest path first algorithm, because it's it's taking a look at the entire path distance, and it's making a decision based on that knowledge. Right now, to extend on what you were saying, I don't want to I don't want to make it seem like uh, our uh, EIGRP is deciding solely based on the metric of this link. Right, R one is not deciding to go to R two because the cost to get to R two this way is less than the cost to get to R3 this way. Ultimately, it's the entire path metric that's included. Here's another analogy, all right? And this might even make it a little bit more clear. It's like if I was to drive from here to San Diego, all right, I'm in Los Angeles, if I, Los Angeles, if I was to drive from here to San Diego, distance vector would be equivalent to getting on the highway and seeing a sign that says San Diego 250 miles, okay? I know I'm going in the right direction and I know the overall path metric, I know the distance, I just don't know what's in between that makes up that distance, right? So I just follow the road signs. As I'm going down the highway, oh, I see a sign that says San Diego, take this exit. So I take that exit and the distance is going down as I get closer and closer. But I, I, I'm, I'm not basing my decisions on understanding every road, every path, et cetera, along the way. I have a general idea of the distance, which is the metric, and I have a general idea of the direction. I just don't know what's in between. Whereas link state is like a GPS where I put in all of my criteria. I want to avoid tolls. I want to, uh, stay on the highways, uh, whatever, whatever criteria I choose to use, the GPS takes all of this information, compares all the different paths that are available, and then based on the criteria, chooses the path. And I can see the entire, you know, I can zoom in and zoom out of the map, and I can see the entire path that that packet is going to traverse to get to the destination. Um, not that I'm doing source routing and I'm trying to define how that path is. I'm still pat routing to the next hop, but I can see the entire path. Does that make sense? Yes. So uh, fundamentally, that's the difference between distance vector and link state. Ideally, though, both protocols should be choosing a next hop based on the best possible choice, which is overall path metric, right? R2 in this case... R2 is making a decision on how to get to network X based on the metrics that it received from R5 and R6 and even possibly R3. So it's going to choose those paths based on those metrics. But again, in this particular case, let's take R3 as an example. Eh, that's not going to work out very well. Let's, let's, let me clear this up a little bit. So let's take uh, R1 as an example in this case. R1 is going to get a, 
uh, route from R2 for network X, and it's going to get a route from R3 to network X. Presumably, the metric that's tied to those routes includes cumulative metrics that were accumulated during the process of exchanging the routing information. So the path metric that R1 receives is ultimately the entire path metric. But again, R1 sees a direction and a distance. The direction is R2 or R3, and the distance is 10 and 20, or whatever the number might be. And so I'm making a decision based on the distance, which then allows me to define the vector, which is uh, the, the direction that I'm going to go. All right? So you can see that there's a huge difference here. Uh, and there are pros and cons to both processes, right? Clearly, I think it's pretty evident that a link state routing protocol would require quite a few more resources than a distance vector routing protocol because uh, link state routing protocol databases are much more robust. The amount of information that's being exchanged is a lot more significant. Uh, and the uh, algorithm is a little bit more complex for that reason. You know, but then the downside of a distance vector protocol is that you don't have complete visibility of the network. So you have to implement features like split horizon and poison reverse and route poisoning and, and specific hold down timers and triggered updates and all kinds of things that traditional distance vector protocols have that link state doesn't, right? Link state routing protocols don't need split horizon. Split horizon is a concept that says never advertise a route back out the same interface that you receive it on because that might cause a loop. Um, distance vector protocols like EIGRP implement successors and feasible successors, and they have a query process and, and feasibility condition and all these other checks and balances to, to, for loop avoidance that a link state protocol simply doesn't need. So um, definitely differences between the two. Definitely pros and cons between the two when you're, when you're learning about how to manage these routing protocols. All right? Very, uh, uh, both very important concepts. Okay? So hopefully that kind of explains that difference. Um, now, I'm not going to suggest that distance vector protocols are useless. Uh, because they just don't have a complete topology, a picture of the topology. That's not the case. Uh, you know, there are other reasons why a distance vector protocol may not be chosen, specifically RIP, uh, as a distance vector protocol. Uh, EIGRP gets put into this classification because that's its nature. It does routing by rumor. There's no way to get around that. It's built into the algorithm. That's how the algorithm works. But... There's a whole bunch of efficiencies that get added to uh, EIGRP that make it look a lot more like a link state protocol. But it is not link state by any means. The, the way that it does route calculations and the, and the type of information that it's getting from its neighbors is, is, uh, is, not, is not based on distance vector principles. Okay? Path vector routing protocols, uh, completely different. All right? We, uh, we, we, we still identify a distance, I mean, a direction, which is vector, but we don't, we don't um, identify uh, distance in, in, the, in the true sense of a metric. We use path, these things called path vector attributes, like weight and, and multi-exit discriminator and local preference and uh, IG uh, interior versus exterior and AS path and so on. We'll get into all of that when we get into the BGP discussion a little bit later on. All right. So these are the kinds of things that, uh, you know, the book doesn't really get into a whole lot of detail on, but I, I think it's really important to understand um, because it, it really speaks to the functionality of the protocol itself and why you would decide to choose one protocol over the other. All right. Now, convergence, that's another thing that we mentioned previously. It is a concept that describes uh, essentially the process where routers identify and, and are able to uh, disseminate changes about the network, right? A metric for a path changes, a, um, a route goes up, a route goes down. Convergence is the process of how long it takes for that information to propagate. 
Uh, there are two fundamental factors that affect convergence. All right, one is not in your control and the other one is completely in your control. The one that's not in your control is simply how the algorithm works. You know, um, how does the protocol advertise information? You know, does it have hold down timers? Does it have flush timers? Does it have, you know, all these different, you know, periodic timers that, that require routes to stay active for a certain amount of time or whatever, like RIP does. Um, the other is completely in your control, which is how did you design the overall architecture? Okay, and we're going to talk about that in this lesson. That's one of the last things we'll talk about in lesson number one, is how do you design the overall architecture? What I mean to say by that is, is, is am I implementing summarization effectively in my network? And there's multiple reasons why summarization would, would definitely play a role. Am I implementing efficiency mechanisms like stub routing or stub areas or special area types in OSPF? or stub routing in EIGRP, or am I implementing query scoping, and all, you know, all kinds of different things that would, uh, would enhance the uh, convergence time of the network. There's only so much you can do with a particular routing protocol to, to speed up the convergence, but there's a lot you can do. Uh, I mean, let me rephrase that. The impact of what you can do can be pretty significant. Uh, there isn't a whole lot you can do but if you do it correctly, it can have a, a very huge impact on the overall convergence of the network itself. So we'll definitely take a look at that. There's no doubt about that. And, and you're going to choose protocols based on that. You know, the capability of the algorithm, number one, you know, how it handles updates and, and uh, you know, how it disseminates routing information. That's number one. Number two, um, you know, what kind of controls do you have in place for you to manage it, right? That's also a very important concept. So the last thing we'll talk about in this lesson is a very, very important concept as well. And we will actually get into this in every, other, every one of the protocols that we talk about, eh, maybe with the exception of RIP. Uh, but with EIGRP and OSPF, we talk about summarization. Uh, BGP, we talk about summarization. Route summarization is a concept uh, in, in which we can add efficiency to our network uh, twofold. Number one, we reduce the size of our databases uh, by reverse subnetting, essentially. I mean, that's essentially what summarization is. It's the opposite of subnetting. Uh, some people even call it supernetting, uh, basically taking a bunch of small networks and advertising them as one large network. All right, um, and there's two reasons why that would be useful. Let me, uh, let me kind of demonstrate this concept. Uh, let's grab a snip of this. So let's say we have this topology here as an example. I'll just grab a screenshot of that, pull that over. So we have this topology as an example here. Make it just a little bit smaller. Yeah, it doesn't auto size. All right, that's fine. It fits in the screen here. All right. Now, as you're looking at this uh, topology here, let me kind of get it centered. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, obviously, we know that routing, from a routing perspective, it's always about getting to the next hop. All right. In this particular case, this is what we call a stub network, meaning that we only have one way in and one way out. Uh, and the next hop for every single one of those routes is the, uh, is the same. All right. So trying to think of how I want to describe this. So when router B wants to get to the 10, 12, 0, 0 network or the 10, 12, 1 network or the 10, 12, uh, 2 network and so on, in every single case, the next hop is the same next hop. It's the same router. So is there really a need for um, the router A to advertise, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different networks to router B? The answer is no, right? Because the next hop is the same in every single case. 
So instead of advertising all of those contiguous address blocks, that's very important for the concept of summarization. Instead of advertising all of those contiguous address blocks, I'm going to advertise a single route that includes or encompasses all of those individual routes. This reduces the size of the routing table. It reduces the amount of data that gets exchanged between the routers. But it does something else, right? It, it allows us to achieve faster convergence. How is that possible? How is, a, how is convergence uh, achieved quicker by advertising a slash 21 as opposed to these eight different slash 24s? Any ideas? Well, there's definitely less entries in the database, but uh, convergence means that uh, a topology change, is a, a change occurs and I have to do some sort of database recalculation. If, I, if this 10, 12, 2 network goes away, does this route change? No. Right, it doesn't change. From, so from router B's perspective, nothing has changed in the topology, and we just continue routing as we normally would. Now, granted, router B is now going to be sending packets to router A for 10, 12, 2. Router A is going to then end up dropping those packets, but, but the, the, the propagation of the change in the topology doesn't have to, has to happen because the summary doesn't change. All right. Now we're going to get into summarization in a lot more detail later on, specific to the protocols. But before we move on to that, I want to go into a couple of these ideas about route summarization. All right. Because I think it's important to understand the fundamentals of route summarization, which you would normally have picked up from a CCNA class, but I'm not going to assume that you guys understand how we got that slash 21 in this case. All right. I only have one slide on summarization in the book, um, but there's a couple of key concepts that I think are really important to understand. All right. Uh, you can summarize anything. All right. Even stuff you do not own. I'll put that in quotes. All right. But let's, let's talk about the math of summarization first. Uh, because uh, that's an important concept, all right? It, it is simply a matter of matter of common versus uncommon bits. 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 All right, there we go. Right, that's ultimately what summarization boils down to. It's a matter of common versus uncommon bits. So if we go to our diagram here, we've got 10, 12, 0 through 10, 12, 7, all right? 10, 10.12.0.0, and finally 10.12.7. All right. Now I think everybody would agree, common versus uncommon, the summary is going to at least include 10. 12, right? Makes sense. Every one of these networks starts with 10, 12. So really the only octet that we're summarizing is the third octet. Uh, because even the dot zero is common to every single one of these networks. You guys agree with that? Those bits are all common. So the act of summarization is finding that boundary of where the bits are common versus where the bits are not common, and that becomes your summarization boundary. So zero is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 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 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. All right. Did I miss any? I think I got them all. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. All right. You guys understand how I got those numbers? 
All right. So my summarization boundary, if I just look down the columns here, becomes this, these bits, because that's the first place where the bits don't match in the column. That becomes my summarization boundary. And the value of those bits to the left of that boundary from a decimal standpoint is zero, which means that becomes my the value in my octet. All right. Now I need to know my prefix for the summary itself. The prefix is essentially the number of bits that were common to all the routes. So we know that we have eight bits that are common because of the first octet. We know we have another eight bits that are common because of the second octet. So we're up to 16 bits that are common, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. And that's how we get the subnet mask. OK? So uh, is there maybe a better way of doing this summary? In this particular case, actually, no. This is a perfect summary because it doesn't include any additional subnets. All right. Now, if I added network 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, now my summary boundary shifts over one bit, and it would become a slash 20. But then what's the problem with that particular summary? Any thoughts? It includes network 9, network 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So it includes other networks that I may not own. That's what I meant when I said you can advertise or you can summarize stuff you own or don't own. All right? So when it comes to designing a network, always keep in mind when you're placing your subnets in different locations throughout the enterprise, when you're defining what your subnet plan is going to be, always keep in mind how you're going to effectively make the network more efficient by creating these natural summary boundaries in your enterprise. Don't put network zero over on the left and put network one on the right and network two on the left and network three on the right and so on. You know, you want to design your network so that you have contiguous address space. Okay. It's not always the way it works, by the way. You guys probably know this. Networks tend to kind of grow on their own and, and uh, you know, uh, before you know it, it's just kind of a big mess, right? But, uh, but if you have the opportunity uh, to, to develop a network from the beginning, always keep in mind what those summary boundaries might look like. All right? Not necessarily mean that every network has to be contiguous. All right? There is something that, that's actually used within routing that, that's very important. So uh, because we are going to be talking about IPv6, I will uh, demonstrate the same concept because binary is binary, isn't it? I mean, when, you, when we talk about addressing, ultimately, actually any kind of, you know, uh, PDU or any kind of PDU element, it's ultimately always binary. But specifically when it comes to addressing, a lot of the concepts that we discuss in IPv4 translate over to IPv6 very, very well. All right, so let's say I've got 2001, DEAD, BEEF. Uh, uh, let's do... Um, Mm, 0003 double colon slash 64 and I'm not going to type that one over and over again so let's go ahead and just throw in several of these all right so there's four there's five there's Charlie and then there is Delta okay so if I said go ahead and summarize these networks into uh, a summary uh, 64 bits means that the uh, first 64 bits of the address or network, uh, these, each of these blocks, they're written in hexadecimal format, and each hexadecimal character is 4 bits. So there are 16 bits in each of these what we call hextets. 4 hextets make 64 bits. So these are all networks. Just like I wrote up, uh, I deleted it, but just like I had written with a 10.16, excuse me, 10.12, those were networks as well. Well, guess what? Common 
versus uncommon, right? 2001, DEAD, BEEF, colon, 000, zero, zero is definitely common in every case, okay? So I know that my summary is going to include at least those bits. Now, if I convert three to its binary equivalent, 0011, 4, 0, 1, 0, 0, 5, 0, 1, 0, 1, Charlie, which is what? 12, agreed? Because A is 10, B is 11, C is 12, so that'd be 1100, zero, zero. and then delta, 1101, all right? Now, in this particular case, I've gone as far as I can, as far as the common bits go. I can't summarize three through delta in a nice, clean, consecutive block. I basically have to use all last all the all the last the last four bits of the fourth hextet all have to be essentially wildcard bits. So that that concludes my summary. In IPv6, you can drop the leading zeros. So this become I won't drop them yet. Let me just leave them there for now. All right, double colon slash what would be my mask? Well, this is 16 bits. This is 32 bits. This is 48 bits. Plus four here. Well, actually, let's just do it this way. Minus four, so it's slash 60, right? Either way, you can add it up or you can subtract. The last four bits are, are not common, so we're not going to use them. My original mask was 64, so this becomes essentially the, the, the uh, summary. Obviously, I don't need the zeros. I can just delete those zeros. Not obviously, but one of the shorthand uh, options that you have is to, is to take away consecutive zeros and then simply represent them as a double colon, which is basically what I just did, right? So, but what if I was to summarize, say, uh, just three, four, and five. Forget the Charlie and the Bravo. I mean, the Charlie and the Delta. In this particular case, three, four, five is right here. So now the common bit goes into this value, right? Into this this nibble, if you will. Uh, four bits is a nibble. So that just simply changes to 61. And that would include uh, zero. And it actually includes several different networks. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. All right, because the last three bits are not included in the summary, those become wildcard bits, which means it can be anywhere from 000 up to 111. Does that make sense? All right. Can you keep that there for a second? Yeah, sure. So, uh, and, and by the way, we are recording this, and so you guys will get these recordings, but uh, I, I can understand the, the, the want to, to copy it down. Let, just let me know when you're done. All right. So, I mean, that's what summarization essentially is, right? Take all the addresses that you're trying to summarize. Don't think of them as IP addresses. Just, they're just addresses, right? You don't even need the prefix that exists with those routes. It doesn't matter. If if this is a if this is an 80, or if it's a if it's a, a 50, uh, uh, it has to be higher. If it's a 66, it ultimately doesn't really matter because all you're doing is comparing the bits together, and you're just trying to find out what's common. That's it. Once you've determined what's common, that becomes your summarization boundary. You count those bits. That becomes your mask and you simply write down the value of those common bits, whether it's in IPv4 or IPv6. So there is a couple of other things I want to mention real quick. Um, we got about 15 minutes left uh, to wrap up this lesson here, but there are a couple more things that I want to talk about that I think are really important. All right, number one, uh, and these are more just little factoids that you need to know about summarization. The uh, yeah, I was going to list this. Out. Let's say that uh, I'm summarizing 10, 12, 0, 0, which is a local route in my routing table. And I'm summarizing 10, 12, 1, 0, slash 24. And I'm summarizing 10, 12, 2, 0, slash 24. All right. 
Uh, in this particular case, I'd have to summarize up to uh, 22 because the last two bits are not common. All right, now you can see how you can kind of do that quickly in your head because you just say, okay, what bits are not common between these three routes? And it's the last two bits that are not common. Zero, 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 one, and one, zero. So I know that I'm going to summarize to 22 because that goes up to those last two bits, which would be 23 and 24. Anyway, that's not what I wanted to mention. Let's say that the metric for this guy is, let's say it's OSPF, so it's 100. And the metric for this route is uh, 105. And the metric for this route is 76. All right. Um, we use cost as a metric in OSPF. The metric for the summary route is the lowest metric of all of the routes included in the summary. All right. So in the case of the summary, which would be 10, 12, 0, 0, slash 22, it would have a metric of 76. If that 10, 12, 2 route went away, the summary would still be advertised, but the seed metric would change to 100. Does that make sense? So the seed metric for the summary route is whatever the lowest metric is of all the routes that are included in the summary. Whether it's IPv4 or IPv6, doesn't matter the protocol, that's the rule. All right, could be OSPF, could be EIGRP. Exception is BGP because BGP doesn't use metrics. That's number one. All right, number two, uh, a summary will only exist if there is a corresponding route in the local routing table, which means that even if you configure a summary statically, if there is no route in the local routing table that's included within that summary, that summary will not be advertised. All right. So uh, let's say I create a summary in this case, it's 10.12.0.0 slash 22. Uh, that's going to get advertised. All right. That's going to get advertised. If this route goes away, still advertised. If both of these routes go away, still advertised. If all three routes go away, the summary stops getting advertised, even though it may still statically be configured. All right. So a summary will only exist if there's a corresponding, missed my end there, corresponding uh, route in the local routing table. All right. In other words, a router is not going to advertise a route for networks that it doesn't know of, networks that don't exist. All right, but the summary will always be advertised as long as there's one route within that range that still exists in the local routing table. And it really doesn't matter how that route's being learned. All right, could be statically, could be a connected route, could be learned through uh, some sort of dynamic routing process through redistribution or whatever. All right, here is the most critical thing to know about a summary. Absolutely the most important thing. And by the way, we'll see this applied when we go into our routing protocols. We're gonna see how route summaries are created, how they're configured and so on later on when we get into our routing protocols. Most critical thing, every single time a summary route is advertised, a corresponding null zero route gets added to the local routing table every single time okay it doesn't matter if it's automatic summarization that's occurring through like an auto summary command or if it's some sort of static summary that you do on eigrp or ospf or whatever a null zero route gets created for that summary so let's say that this was a a route that i a summary that was created through uh you know using the ip summary summary dash address command eigrp 100.10.12.0.0.255.255.252.0, right? So this is, uh, this is an interface command that you would do in EIGRP to create a summary. So it's a statically configured summary. Automatically, there's going to be a route in the routing table for that same route, 10.12.0.0 slash 22, that points to 
no, zero. And by the way, the no, zero interface is a bit bucket. Now, I will have the 10, 12, 0, 0, slash 24 route, my routing table. Let's call that a, an EIGRP route. And I'll have the 10, 12, 1, 0 in my routing table. And I'll have the 10, 12, 2, 0 in my routing table. But I'll also have this no, zero route. And all these guys are EIGRP routes. EIGRP, EIGRP. Why does the no, zero route get created? Any ideas? Right. It's a loop avoidance mechanism. It is specifically there to ensure that packets that get routed to a destination that's included in the summary that you don't know about doesn't get routed with like a default route. Right. In fact, let's even say that I have a default route in my routing table. All right. That might be a static default route, whatever. OK. What happens if I get a packet to this router that goes to 10, 12, 3.4, which is totally possible because the 10, 12, 3 summary, the 10, 12, 3 network is included in the summary, the slash 22. This slash 22 includes network 0, network 1, network 2, and network 3 because it's the last two bits of the third octet. So people are going to believe that they can get to the 10, 12, 3 network by coming to me. Well, the 10, 12, 3 network does match this static route. So it is possible without the no zero route that the 10, 12, 3 packet might get sent out based on my default route. That's why the no zero route gets created because I want to make sure that this packet matches the no zero route and gets dropped because I don't know I don't have any more specific information about that particular destination. And we know that routers, eh, maybe you know, maybe you don't, but routers make routing decisions based on prefix length. We choose the best possible match in the routing table. Uh, and uh, so if a packet is going to 10, 12, 4, 4, it's going to use, uh, excuse me, 2, 4. It's going to use this route because slash 24 is a better match than slash 22 which is a better match than slash zero. This packet actually matches three different routes in this routing table, but it's going to choose the EIGRP route because it has a better, it has more bits based on the prefix link that match the packet than the other two routes. All right. So um, I guess that's about it for summary for now. Uh, we will definitely talk about this again a little bit later on when we get into the discussion of the individual protocols. You know, how does summarization work in EIGRP? How does it work in OSPF and so on? So we will get into that a little bit later on. All right? So if you, hey, real quick, if you, if you go back to that. Um, sure. I think that we're going to get into it later. Uh, but that's, this is really where it seems like you can get a lot of mess, uh, a lot of messiness in the environment. Because it, rather than having it, uh, a router advertised but now you're not properly advertising your network. I think we, we John, I don't know um, if you feel the same way, but we have a lot of that kind of stuff going on. Yeah, yeah, we do. We got a lot of cleanup stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, that, and again, this is all about engineering principles, right? This is where you have to understand what the impact of doing summarization is and what the impact of maybe even not doing summarization is uh, uh, or not having contiguous subnets or whatever it might be, right? So it's a really important concept, and, and absolutely you can get suboptimal routing. You can have, uh, you, you can have um, uh, routing loops. You could, you could create asymmetric routing paths where you get unpredictability or seemingly unpredictability uh, you know, based on a packet taking one path to go one way and then taking a different path to come a different way. Um, and, uh, and especially with the EIGRP in OSPF, it's a little bit more difficult to screw up because in OSPF, you can only summarize on two different types of routers, but in EIGRP, you can summarize anywhere on any interface in any direction. So, uh, let's say somebody says, Oh, you know what? I see all these routes in here. 
I'm going to go ahead and summarize them, but then they don't summarize at a different router that, that provides an alternate path. Guess what? The individual routes are going to take precedence because they have a longer prefix than the summary route, which may not be the best path, but when I'm choosing between two different routes in the routing table, I don't compare the metrics between a slash 22 and a slash 24. I say, well, the slash 24 is better, period, because it has uh, a longer match, right? Uh, the only time a metric comes into play is when I'm trying to decide what to put in the routing table. So yeah, it's definitely something you, 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 you need to pay attention to, all right? So uh, last thing we'll talk about in this lesson uh, before we break for lunch is, you know, uh, the scalability of the protocol. And I, I kind of already talked about this a little bit. You know, we, we want to make sure that we're choosing a protocol based on the, uh, the, the number of routes that it, can, that it can understand. I mean, how large can the database get? How many adjacencies can that router have? Uh, the number of routers. Uh, the number of routes doesn't necessarily mean route X, Y, Z, A, B, C, etc. It means route network X, 10 different paths. Network Y, 10 different paths. Network Z, 5 different paths. So the number of routes means not only how many um, routes exist, but how many ways can I get to those destinations? Because that, that speaks to the density of the routing topology database. Maybe not the routing table, but the routing topology database. Because remember, the topology database includes everything that I'm learning. Everything that I'm learning. All right? So you've got, uh, you know, lots of things to consider. How often does the network change? Uh, you know, what kind of resources do I have available on my platforms? Because some protocols require more resources than other and so on. All right? So that is uh, the end of that lesson. What we're going to get into in the next lesson is just uh, kind of taking a look at uh, different types of traffic in the network. We'll talk about uh, network types, like what's non-broadcast multi-access. Uh, you know, how does the internet separate internal domains? And we'll take a look at IPv6 and so on uh, after the break. All right.